YouTube. Welcome back to another History Teacher Acts video, Mr. Terry. Today we are going to be finishing up the awesome and super well done Extra History series on the 1918 flu pandemic. So this is episode six of six. Uh, if you missed anything before, go. you can go through my playlist. And uh, if you're looking for my, my reaction as a history teacher to this, um, should be able to find episodes one through five. So this is the final one, and they titled it The Forgotten Plague, which is a great title, I think, no matter what they're going to talk about in here. Because one of the biggest things, probably the biggest thing I've taken away from learning now more about the 19 flu, uh, 1918 flu pandemic was how much I underestimated it. And I don't think I'm the only one, um, even from an educate, educator's perspective. Just because it's, I mean, when, first off, in, in history, it's hard to teach everything. But this also gets overshadowed by World War One, which really shouldn't, in a way, because this uh, pandemic killed way more people than the war did. In fact, if you're on the high end of estimates, you can combine World War One and World War Two, and maybe about as much, uh, and is going to be very similar to this plague. And that's just kind of blown my mind there. And it's been very timely. I think that we're going through this, uh, going through this series, and I, I want to do it during this time. Uh, with the obvious comparisons to the current COVID-19 pandemic that is going on while I'm doing this series. It's the reason I kind of picked this out. So we can um, compare and contrast the two, look at the responses, look at the causes and that sort of thing and see what we can learn from the past to inform us basically right now. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump in. The original video link is down below, so make sure you give them a, uh, um, give them their support. They're a supporter of the channel here, and uh, they deserve your likes, views, subs, and all that stuff. And if you haven't subbed to my channel yet, love to have you around, be part of our community. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So, The Forgotten Plague, Episode 6, the final. This year... Rio de Janeiro, 19... Okay, Brazil. This year... Carnival is different. Ooh. The flu that had killed 15,000 in Rio. Carnival is a massive party of close proximity. This would be a nightmare for the spread of the plague. One of the wor one of the worst places there could props or events that could possibly be in peacetime at least. Oh, is gone, but its spirit lingers. Float crews adopt macabre themes taken from the height of the outbreak. Oh. There's the block of the holy house playing off a popular euphemism for the hospital. Behind them parades the block of the midnight tea, named after a rumor that doctors killed terminal flu patients with opium overdoses. Streetcars... Just to treat them? Geez, they're not being very sensitive about the uh, carnival celebration. So there's like parades, so they have floats, and a little too soon, right? <laughs> they're right in the middle of it, and they're... Are they making light of it? I don't know. Maybe it's a different cultural thing of what happens with carnival with these things, but... Seems like something people would not joke about. I mean, imagine if they did that now, if like the Fourth of July parade, which will be in a couple months, um, in America, like doing something like that floats on that. Uh, it just, I don't know. Even if it's like honor the front lines, people. I don't know. It still seems like bad timing, bad taste. I don't know. It's past. Probably decorated with teapots and cemetery gates. A few months before, the same streetcars had collected the city's dead. Oh. Gross. Now, are you getting the idea here that they think this is over? Um, I thought I had heard, this said 1919, I, I thought I heard the last, because it goes through 1920, was the, uh, actually, the, like, the worst part. And they kind of said that in earlier videos, that you had the first sort of wave of it in 1918, and into 1919, and then it kind of stops, and then comes back even harder. So I'm also wondering what 1920 looked like. The third wave of the pandemic kept killing until 1920, but it was clear that the worst was over. Humans had done little to stop the virus. Instead, it simply ran out of fuel. Those who caught it became immune, and it spread across the globe so fast, infecting so many people, that herd immunity began to protect those who escaped previous waves. Now I've heard of this too, because I've heard of like nations and things that are talking about this herd immunity, where it's like, well, I don't know if it means like intentionally just give it to everybody so it can run its course and whatever and then what just treat the people. That seems like that would also be not good just for the fact that so many people would die of it, but it would end it sooner in a way. I, I got to look into more of that, but I've heard that in the modern sense uh, being talked about. But I've, I've usually heard it as, as seen as like, like, they sh like you shouldn't do it, but I don't know. But there were still flare ups. 
On November 11th, 1918, the news broke, an armistice. The Great War was over. Fun fact, remember the 11s, right? The war ended, okay, 1918, 11th month, so November, 11th day, 11, and at 11 a.m. Interesting, 11, 11, 11. Can help you remember when the war was over. That's when the armistice was done. The peace treaty, of course, is in uh, 1919, the Treaty of Versailles. People flooded the streets, ignoring bans on public gatherings. And in each city, a new wave of infections followed the impromptu celebrations. The same would happen again and again on a smaller scale, as loved ones gathered to welcome returning soldiers home. There were still outbreaks, still deaths, but everyone could see it was trailing off. The One thing you're seeing already is, I think that's different from now and then before. Now there are so, this seems to be just across the board, way more legislation to prevent mass gatherings. That's one of the biggest things I think I've noticed from this between now and then is back then they kind of had these things, but it was not, not even, it seems like overall it's not even close to what we have, uh, uh, what preventative measures are going through in our society globally right now. That may be one of the biggest things that I've noticed is a contrast between the reactions of the two. And the first one, very little um, as compared to now prevention for the spread. It just, it's not being undertaken nearly as much. Horror was passed. All that remained was to count the cost, a project that continues to this day. In the years after the pandemic, researchers initially estimated the disease had killed 20 million people. It's way more. Modern estimates more have than increased double. that number to 50 million. Yeah. Though because statistics aren't available in the worst hit regions, like India and Russia, the final number may be twice as many. That's crazy. I mean, that's a huge margin of error. It went from 20 to 50 to 100. That's a, that's a lot. That's a huge margin of error. So I don't know. Is it just one of these things where you, you say the truth probably lies in the middle somewhere? According to modern estimates, it killed 17 to 20 million in India, perhaps 4 million in Indonesia, possibly a million in Russia, 400,000 in France, and 390,000 in Japan. In the United Kingdom, it sickened a quarter of the population and killed up to 220,000. In the U.S., it took around 675,000 more than the civil war and killed 16,000 in Philadelphia alone. That 675 number um, obviously is, is enormous. Um, I thought I had heard, didn't they say in a previous episode, and I think I had heard it didn't, wasn't there like 200,000 dead in like a month, October of the first month or whatever, or one of the months I thought I remember that being a month or two that saw just a, a way bigger number than any other month by far. But for a disease that killed so many, it's hard to point out direct consequences. In fact, the flu seems to have worked in tandem with the war, each magnifying the effects of the other. In the 1920s, a wave of political unrest swept countries around the globe. This was because of the war, but also because the flu had revealed deep inequalities, especially in colonial rule. Post-viral fatigue... They, they if you forgot, um, were the biggest accusation of that... Uh, the the how it affected uh, unequally affected socioeconomic groups uh, was with Imperial India. So India was colonized and ruled by the British Empire. And the big criticism there was that all the resources and money was not going to the Indian citizens. The British were using it. If they were using it in India, it was on um, more the, the British descendant uh, population that lives in India, which is a reason why it died you know, or 20 million people may have died there. So that, that exposed that again, they, they said in the last episode, talk about racism and stuff and how events like this often uh, magnify racism, negative stereotypes, all that kind of stuff. Marginalized groups seems to be very common. From flu infections probably contributed to the depression and listlessness that took hold after the war. Makes sense. Yet, despite the heavy toll the flu took, and the heroism of medical workers that died fighting it. There's still no monument commemorating the event, other than plaques marking mass graves. Mm -hmm. Textbooks mention it, but usually just in passing. Yeah, I'll be. I'll attest to that. It's like a eh, little tiny thing. There was a flu. It broke out, and it was a lot of people died, and that was it. I I, I won't be doing that again. I can tell you that. I said in the previous videos now how. 
now is like the next school year when we meet. Um, it's obviously going to be something that's that's very intri- or, uh, or on people's minds. It's one reason I think why the, the flu is not talked about is there's nobody really alive left that experienced that thing. And that usually happens once you're completely removed your generations from an event. If the history isn't very strong, that thing will tend to be forgotten. And I think this will be a lot stronger in curriculums. I know I'll, I, I want to commit to that. We chose not to remember which is why some have christened it the but, forgotten plague. Yeah, but why? There are theories why society chose to forget the flu. Perhaps it came and went so fast that people simply remembered it as part of the war. Or it's possible Probably. that focus on the war and inability to see the big picture meant that society never really absorbed what happened. But keep in mind, it also hit a generation that was just more used to epidemics in a time where mass death True. may have been less shocking. Sure. Things like cholera. Um, this is now towards the end of the big, huge phase of the Second Industrial Revolution. Actually, it's kind of amongst it, where urbanization was uh, faster than we'd ever seen in world history. People were moving into cities for industrial jobs because the workforce and all the job opportunities are shifting very, very rapidly away from agriculture, which has been the, for basically all of human history until the last hundred years was what most people did for a living. They worked in agriculture. Now it's a tiny percentage of people that actually work in agriculture. So people are moving into cities and uh, it was very common for diseases to break out in these cities because these cities were growing at such a rate, there was no infrastructure for things like sewage and water treatment and all that stuff. So things like cholera um, also killed, like I think millions maybe in the world. Uh, so that was just part of that but all those and now we're going to be getting to vaccines but things like polio uh, would would have been one that again killed a lot of people tuberculosis um, things like that conversely some have argued that the flu was so traumatic families formed unspoken agreements never to discuss it the memories that did endure were intensely personal lost parents lost siblings friends gone too soon but wouldn't wouldn't you be able to make that argument for the war as well families impoverished when their breadwinners died. In some cases, soldiers came back from the trenches to find their entire family wiped out. Ask your family, <sighs> and you might find a story Lucky of your to own. Survive it Generations later, nothing. the trauma still lingers. Yet apart from Catherine Ann Porter's Pale Horse, Pale Rider, there was no explosion of novels about flu as there were about the war. Yeah. It was a more difficult subject. Its faceless enemy more challenging to portray than the man-made terror of the trenches. But Porter wasn't the only notable person to suffer from the flu. In fact, it infected so many famous people that it raises a chilling question. How different would our world be if even one of them had died? Well, Gandhi had it but survived. The Spanish, the King of Spain had it. They didn't say, I, I think he survived, right? He, he survived. And again, that's actually why it's often been coined the Spanish flu. So if you heard Spanish flu, you're actually talking about the same thing. I don't know. The name doesn't really make much sense. But but because the, the King of Spain, who else get it? Anybody, um, any famous people die from it? I don't know off the top of my head. Among the ill were President Wilson, British Prime Minister David Lloyd George, Gandhi, Kaiser Wilhelm, and General Pershing, wow. a generation of notable artists caught it as well, including T.S. Eliot and a young ambulance driver named Walt Disney. Huh. So they all got it. Oh, Franklin Roosevelt contracted it while sailing on USS Leviathan. Poor guy, because he got polio, um, and that basically took his life. Then there are the people we did lose. The president-elect okay, of Brazil. Okay, here we go. This is, what, this is what I was asking for. So these are people that got it and died, I guess. President who? Iathan. Then there are the people we did lose. The president-elect of Brazil and Austrian painters Egon Schiele and Gustav Klimt. Lenin's right-hand man succumbed, clearing the way for his replacement, Ooh. Joseph Stalin. And in New York, the flu killed an obscure German immigrant, allowing his son to cash in his life insurance and expand the family's real estate business. His name was Frederick Trump. You might be familiar with his grandson, but... Who, who would be related to Frederick Trump? Hmm. The flu also drove scientific discovery. Doctors developed new surgical techniques and procedures for disease containment. Very good. It likely sped up the civilian world's adoption of ambulances. How much of a shame would it have been if we went through all that and then had no medical advancement? That would just be in vain. The desperate vaccines produced during the pandemic 
cocktails of antibodies from every bacteria doctors suspected, were the predecessor of today's combination vaccines, like diphtheria tetanus pertussis. Nurses who bore so much of the burden won new confidence and respect for their profession. Increasingly, for them. their discipline became more than serving as doctor's assistants, and the flu helped them be seen as professionals in their own right. Well, we're going to see. I mean, I, I guess you wouldn't connect it to it. But one, one big thing they talk about with the, the war uh, was like in America, um, right after the war was over, uh, women got the right to vote in America. So I don't know. But hopefully you saw things like nurses hopefully getting closer to equal pay with men and stuff like that. But Many cities and nations caught off guard by the crisis established new health departments and organizations to monitor disease. CDC, it helped important. push the idea of national health insurance and government provided medicine. And it drove research. By the 1930s, researchers were crafting effective flu vaccines. And many who battled flu would go on to do great things. Anna Williams nurtured an entire generation of female research. She was the awesome one, right? That would like drive cars all crazy and stuff. Cheers. FDR eulogized Welch via radio. And remember Oswald Avery, the guy Welch tasked with finding Pfeiffer's bacillus and who helped develop the pneumonia serum? After the war, he returned to researching bacteria, trying to discern how a bacteria without a hard coating transformed into a bacteria with one. After laboring for 20 years, he finally found the substance that caused the change, DNA. That's right. Avery discovered that the purpose of DNA is to carry genetic instructions. Today, he's considered a pioneer of modern genetics. That's amazing. That's where we get that. The, the founding. DNA has completely changed the world of biology and like everything. Um, its discovery is, is it's opened up so much understanding for biology. It, I think it's hard to to um, to, to appreciate as much as, as, as we should. <laughs> the flu also drove research into Pfeiffer's bacillus, which many still believed caused flu. After working in a military hospital during the war, one Scottish doctor devoted his life to studying microbes. One day, he accidentally left a culture of it out for the night. When he returned the next morning, he found a strange mold growing on it that killed any bacteria it touched. That man was Alexander Penicillin. Fleming. And the mysterious mold? It was penicillin, the first wonder drug and probably the most consequential discovery of the 20th century. Wow. Yeah, penicillin um, completely paved the way for, for yeah, uh, vaccinations and stuff like that. Pen penicillin was, yeah, the cure-all for everything. Um, that's neat. Uh, it's it's so, it, it's like this, this event was obviously such a terrible thing, but it's good that we have come such a long way right uh with what we've learned from it which is going to bring the question um with the current pandemic what are we going to learn what are we going to take away from it what are we going to be able to uh, turn into a positive for the future even today the 1918 flu remains a subject of study for researchers in fact over the last several decades researchers and epidemiologists have started to make breakthroughs on the 1918 flu Helping us better understand what happened Even 100 so years we can after. combat the next great pandemic. Re dun, dun, dun. This video series was made before. It was 2018, so it was made before. Pretty timely, huh? Researchers still don't know where the flu emerged. There are way more theories than we portrayed, but we can now name the culprit. In 1998, researchers obtained a lung sample from a frozen grave in Alaska and confirmed what many suspected. The 1918 flu was H1N1, an avian strain, new then, but is less... You might have heard of that. That had a little um, breakout not too long, just a few years ago, uh, that people were fearing could turn into something, you know, like, like now with COVID. It's dangerous now that our immune systems have had a century of exposure. They've also begun to unravel the pandemic's mysteries. For instance, we now suspect that it killed young, healthy people precisely because they were young and healthy. <laughs> Those patients wow. that turned blue, they probably weren't killed by the flu at all, but by their own immune systems. Once infected, victims' immune systems triggered a massive inflammatory response known as a cytokine storm. But instead of neutralizing the flu, this enormous release of disease-killing cytokines filled the lung sacs with fluid and inflamed them so much they couldn't absorb oxygen. This is blowing my mind that we, we, we know this now. 
But the greatest lesson of the flu pandemic is that flu can't be ignored. We don't shrug off new flu strains anymore. In fact, many health organizations monitor both human and animal strains, predicting the dominant variety each season and creating vaccine ahead of time. That's what I know for, for what's going on now is different is there was no vaccine. There, there is no vaccine. There's no real strong natural immunity to it. Uh, you are healthy enough to fight it or not, but we don't have it in us, which is what alarmed, I think, the medical field from what I understand. Again, I don't want to comment too much about the, 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 the um, biology of what's going on now. I'm not in any way authorized or, or have the criteria, the credentials to do that. If a new strain does arrive, we'll be much more prepared than doctors were in 1918. We have electron microscopes, antivirals, vaccine labs, and tested containment plans. But a vaccine yep. would still take months to produce. That's what's going on now. We uh, still have one. This, this has been around for months now and still nothing. Meaning we'd start by using the same measures they did a century ago. Voluntary quarantine, banning public gatherings, Staggering work hours. Okay, so we're seeing those, right? Voluntary quarantine. Okay. And in some areas, it's not voluntary. It's, no, you're you're inside. You know what I mean? Um, you have to, you know, become something essential, right, for that to happen. Uh, gatherings, yeah. They've, they've seen that happen now. And I can already tell that it seems that these measures that you see here on the screen uh, were... Um, far more enforced it looks like than than what happened in 1918 so something to think about that you know not saying necessarily if you didn't have these would the flu go to the extent the 1918 flu would but it seems like what they're saying here is it you know that we're looking at it that you 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 put that into the realm of possibility right because they didn't do that in 1918 not very well in fact as Rob researched these episodes, the city where he lives, Hong Kong, closed schools to prevent a seasonal flu outbreak and killed birds that tested positive for avian influenza. A century later, the battle against the 1918 flu and its offspring continues. So seriously, get your flu shot from an actual medical professional and not a uh, animated cat. I don't know a lot about flu vaccines that people took, you know, people take them every year. What effect that has had on uh, potentially getting the, the current COVID-19, um, if that helped at all, or just simply there's the, the vaccine or, you know, the, the flu vaccines or whatever, they, uh, these flu shots don't attack that strain at all. I actually don't know a lot. And I don't want to get into that as much because I need to uh, find out more. So I don't want to, I don't want to say anything about that, but. Wow, perfect timing that they did this uh, about two years ago uh, because it ended up timing itself pretty much perfectly with, with, with that. Although they were referencing the uh, avian flu, this has been a much bigger deal. So, interesting. Um, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts, in a way, without getting real political, about this? Uh, compare and contrast. You all need to write an essay right now. Compare and contrast the... <laughs> Uh, 1918 flu pandemic with what's going on now. That's hard to also do because we're right in the middle of it as the time of uh, the production of this um, video in May of 2020. But uh, what we know so far about how it was spread, how is it affecting? Now, the big glaring difference, of course, was we don't have a world war that's happening right now, which amplified this thing. And uh, there are better, better facilities now, but people were still, you know, people have still said, though, that in, in a lot of ways we were uh, we don't quite have the facilities or whatever or the, the ability to treat as many people as a pandemic like this could infect right they they, they were talking about um, what is it uh, 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 like change the curve or whatever um, flatten the curve or whatever so it meaning we have to, you have to put in a lot of these things, these, uh, even, you know, for healthy people and all that stuff or places that don't have it, because if it did break out, everybody at once would be needing medical treatment and the infrastructure of the medical industry just can't handle that. Right. Flatten the curve. Right. That's what they would say. Um, but yeah, you've seen a big difference in how it's, it's been treated 
far more seriously um, right now with with what governments are doing. Governments are willing to put in a lot of these things, which of course has um, had huge economic ramifications. But what can you compare and contrast thus far? We'll be able to do a lot more of this once the pandemic is over and we'll be able to, to really compare things. But just from what we've seen about uh, how it's been intervened with, right? I think that's going to be one of the biggest things. So as this starts to unfold, I think we can keep studying this stuff and learning more about, um, about this in the past, you know, 100 years ago and trying to make those, uh, make those connections. All right. Well, awesome. I, I'm really happy that we got this. This was a series that was already heavily, uh, had had been uh, heavily uh, recommended to me since I started my channel um, a little less than a year ago. But uh, I thought it was definitely perfect timing um, for this. And hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, hopefully you were able to share this information with other people uh, to make that contrast. Because most people don't know about this or really care to know about it. And that's a shame, right? So let's be the, the people as people that truly appreciate history to be able to spread the things that we learn. I think that's really important. All right. With this, one more final plug. Uh, make sure you go down below. Link to the original video will be there. And uh, yeah, definitely support um, Extra History with that. They're, they're great folks doing a, a great job here on the internet, educating people in, in a fun, informative way. And I can tell that because of how much you guys um, enjoy these videos. And I do too. All right. Okay. On the way out, uh, if you haven't subbed, love to have you sub to my channel. Thanks for liking the videos. Um, enable notifications so you know when my live uh, premieres or streams are. I do video game streams. I do uh, history trivia nights and all kinds of just things. I'm always trying to do fun, interactive things. Join our Discord server. Link is down below. Check out our Teespring account. Um, and just uh, Patreon if you want to get involved with um, that community, which votes on videos. Uh, a lot of ways you can do that. So, But thank you for just for being here, being a part of the history community here on YouTube and supporting history education. And with that, we'll see you next time. Bye.